Neki and I are back. I, kill- I miss you, buddy. I miss you. This is this is finally back, man. Dude, remember when we went all the way to Japan and we forgot our mics to record podcasts and I now we know. have to do it at home? It's <laughs> my bad. We my were bad. together for fault. like a weekend and we didn't record even one pod. Yeah. That's that was that was weird, man. But man, come on. How cool is it going to Japan for the weekend? Yeah, that was nuts. I, I'll never forget <laughs> walking to that restaurant that we basically went all that way to go to eat at. And they're like, You smell too bad. And we're like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, No, no, no. And like Japan and like Japanese are like, smell, smell, like you smell too much. And we're like, what are you talking about? And we learned that it was because, you know, we had deodorant on or cologne on or whatever. And they're like, no, it's going to mess with like the experience of like smelling the fish and the food. Nuts. Man, I don't, I don't want to smell fish. So that's, that's good, good for <laughs> me, man. But come on, that meal was legit. That was yeah. a, that was a good meal. 15, 15 pieces of sushi. And it, it was cool, man. Like that's a, that's a famous dude that uh, Jiro, I forgot his name, Jiro's, Jiro's son. But it was it was legit sushi, and it was awesome. I, I really enjoyed like experiencing all that with you. We went go karting down the streets. Man, we learned. Man, time. I feel like we're like Tokyo. Like we could we could lead a tour now for all the stuff we've done. Hey, yeah, we were there for like yeah. I think two and a half days, right? Yeah, like two two full days and then half days on each side with the travel. And we probably did what an average person would do in like a week and a half there. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, no, no was... that's wicked. And our buddy Dean joined us. Dean's an orthodontist in Saskatoon and, and we're going to get him on the pod. But uh, man, I just I just love him so much. He, he just gets so excited over food. And <laughs> I'll never forget that video when he tried ramen and he was like, oh, oogly googly. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Dean, say the like, typical whitest thing you can possibly say after trying something with spice he's like googly moogly that's good (laughs) (laughs) it was incredible and an avid listener of the podcast he was pulling out stories he was like remember when you said this remember when you said that he's probably listening to this pod yeah good man man we're coming for you dean yeah yeah, he's too nervous to come on but he's coming on anyway man too humble to come on he's like what do i have to say and he's like man that guy is in the quest for perfection and the cool part about him is like, man, I will never get there. And he's like, man, out of all these years of being an ortho, I've never had the perfect case. And it kind of like, it kind of resonated with what Jiro was saying at the sushi restaurant. What do you say? His master, he's only, what do you say? He said, and I asked him, how many years have you, you know, been yeah. a sushi chef for? He was like 43 43 yeah, years? 43 years. Yeah. But he's like, I'm nothing. I'm just a student compared to my master who's at 98. Yeah. That That's crazy. Blowing. And like, you've been a sushi sushi chef for 43 years and you're still not a master. And, and he was like, yeah, my dad, he's he's double me and he's still working, 98 years old. That's amazing to, and, and like, I don't know. I As soon as I thought of that, I was like, man, this is Dean Heinrichs right here. Like, cause he- <laughs> he he understands that like you you will never like reach that perfection you're always a student and then it like got me thinking of our job all the time like on a daily basis i'm making mistakes right i'm like man i'm still a student i'm still learning there's no such thing as like you know being the master of it because you are always learning there's always going to be a case that throws you for a loop there's there's always new it's always new materials and techniques coming out so i think it was a good lesson for let, let's call that the lesson of the trip I agree. I agree. That was, yeah. that was pretty special. <laughs> that was, that was probably one of the more, you know, eye opening parts of the trip where, you know, he's like, I'm nothing compared to my master. And he's like, you know, like what, what, what's nothing compared to your master? Like, it's, it's like after 43 years, I feel like most people doing the same thing would be like, yeah, you know, I got the hang of it, but it's <laughs> that, that definitely wasn't the case. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that was that was pretty cool. And also this summer, man, you went on a you went on a big trip. You went on a mission trip. Your first mission trip, dude. Welcome to the club. It was eye opening. It was spectacular. Where'd you go? Was, uh, Where'd you go? We we went to Grenada. So uh, okay, yeah, where Grenada. is that? Uh, Grenada is in the Caribbean. So uh, okay, and I'm making sure not to confuse it with Grenada because I was told Grenada is like a curse word in Grenada. They're like, if you say Grenada, oh. it's like a it's like the equivalent of telling someone to like F off or something. 
So it's like, oh, if you really? say Granada, if you go, if you ever go to Grenada, never say Granada because they get really pissed off. But a patient told me that. If you, is there a place called Granada though? I thought there was. No, isn't there? There's this place that I think so, and I think it's in Spain. Maybe there's a oh, okay there's another Grenada or the Granada rather, not another Grenada. There is a Granada, but uh, dude, it was spectacular. It was, it was you're you're a veteran. What did what did uh, what did you think of the trip man, living by Carrie? No, 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 man. I need to I need to hear it from you because my first trip was to Guatemala in 2000, 2009 or two thousand nine or two thousand ten with one of my best friends, Carl Martin, and uh, uh, we went to Guatemala. But like, man, the first trip is always special. I want to hear I want to hear your your thoughts of the trip because oh, I boy. always come home and it's a mind. It, it's just a mind mess. I won't say what I really want to say, but it it really. Uh, it throws you for a loop, man. I want to hear your thoughts about the trip. Like, what was it like there? It does. But before we start, I should mention this episode sponsored by Jay Lore. Jay Lore. Uh, <laughs> Jay Lore Winery. <laughs> I see. That. I'm like, is this dude drinking wine? I just, <laughs> it's the first time we think of it ever. Uh, I think Josh was the first person to ever drink on the podcast. But now, you know, <laughs> after the summer, you know, spent some time in Italy. You know, you gotta you gotta loosen up a little bit, but. That's besides the point. The 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 trip was actually <laughs> <laughs> the trip was the trip was special because the patient base you're treating and the the different lens you see basically everything you do, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. And that's good and bad because I find that you have patients who you know you go in there you're thinking I'm doing free dentistry. You're gonna have patients that are you know extremely grateful, but that's not all of the patients you treat. A lot of them are just kind of like nope. you know you know. You did my thing. Get out. Won't even say thank you, right? Yeah. And, okay. Okay. Uh, so that's a, such an important point. Yeah, dude. It took me. It. It. it that was the mind. Um. I. I had to, a hard time wrapping my head around that, and I had to play with that in my mind for a bit. And so, it's interesting because when you go there, you expect a thank you. So what does that say about what we're doing? Do you know what I mean? Did us. you think about that? Yeah, we're doing it. For we're us, doing it 100%. for us, man. We're not doing it for them. We're doing it for us. And it took me a long time. Like, dude, that kid didn't even say thank you. I thought all these people would be so grateful for, for us coming here and they don't care. They don't like, of course, a lot of people care and some people, they don't say thank you. And then you're like, Hmm, like what was up with that? He didn't even say thank you. And then you have to realize it's for us, man. Yeah. You know, I think dude, you're, I feel like you're a veteran already now. Yeah. (laughs) We've talked about that in the past. Just like what the, what the scope, what your scope of giving is is really important because you know if you're if you're not clear about that you're just constantly going to be searching for something that you're not necessarily looking for right so if you go there and you know clearly okay i'm doing it for me it's it's like a different lens so i think i was i was prepped because i know you right and you've done like a million of these trips but i think that was one thing the other thing was like i i've never we've talked about this where i'm like i'm quite stoic in the clinic right it's like I don't really put my hands on patient shoulders. I'm not that kind of clinician, uh, uh, but yeah. for the first time in a dental setting, I cried and really? I, like, I yeah, I cried and I was like, I, and I'm not a crier. Oh. I don't, I don't really like, that's not my default emotion, but I remember seeing this patient and we're like, okay, massive, you know, interproximal carries, you know, between one, one and two, one. And we're like, I'm like, oh God. And like, right as we're waiting for the demo or like the supervisor to come across, cause we always have to get everything signed off by them. I'm talking to this patient and I'm like, what are your hobbies? What are your interests? And he's like, oh, I love high jump. And I'm like, make him jump over the chair. Right. And I'm like, you know, show me his like moves. And like, we develop a bond. And then, you know, we take the radiographs, consult with the, the uh, supervising dentist. And he goes, yeah, we're going to have to extract these. And these are his permanent central incisors. And he immediately just starts to ball his eyes out. And then I'm sitting there and I feel like such a jerk because I made him like happy at the beginning. I kind of like let him on and like let him down the wrong direction. And then I start bawling my eyes out and I'm like, oh my God, like, what do, what do we do? Like, these are this kid's permanent central incisors. We can't just pull them out and pretend like nothing's happened. And I mean, so we tried, but I mean, it's it's debatable whether or not they'll you know be okay but i mean for the first time ever i've cried in a patient setting which i thought was pretty interesting yeah 
my therapist and wow. I have talked a lot about it, but <laughs> it's, Man, it's, it's, it was uh, moving. It was moving. Yeah. And it, it's different here than it is there because here there's access to care and there's access to the opportunity to maybe get a root canal. And even if you can't financially afford it, there's other clinics that you can go to. There's funding. There's a Canadian dental grant now. Like there is access to care somewhat in Canada, right? But when you go to um, a developing country, you may not have that same access to care. So if you could do a root canal down there, um, you may not be able, or a root canal up here, you may not be able to do that root canal down there. So, you know, you don't want to keep the person or have the person in pain. So the other option is you take it out. And I've often fought in my head about that. And it's almost just like, no, I kind of just want to keep it there because I feel like losing it is worse off than, than taking it out. So like or losing it is yeah, definitely worse off than just leaving it. Do you agree? Yeah. But it, it's like, you never experienced that here where you're kind of restricted by research. Well, you do if the patients can't afford it, but it's yeah. still like, I mean, you're, you've been in private practice. I've never been in private practice, but typically like if something is abs- like essential incisor, people will do a lot in order to keep those. Am I wrong? Yeah, they would. Yeah, no, you're totally right. So it's like, I remember yeah. the mom's like, I'm a single mom. I can't afford, like, I was like, are you sure you don't want to go to like, you know, private practice here? And she's like, there's zero chance I can afford this. So do what you can. And oh my gosh, it was such an emotional procedure. Truly. It was one of my yeah. friends that helped me with it too. Um, shout out to Lucy. She's in my class. But it was a it was a tough one, man. It was really tough. So did you end up just trying to do some big fillings uh, around there, or what? Yeah, we just we tried to do some uh, some big fillings, but again, how how is that going to hold over time? Who's to say? Yeah. So so now you have to think, right? Because this is where my brain goes, and you're like, okay, so you did these big fillings; they're probably touching the pulp, and then we pieced out. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like we left. And and so like, say that kid, okay, he has some major sensitivity for the next couple of days and then maybe they'll calm down. But a month from now, okay, let's just say a month could be five months, whatever. Now he's in pain. Now what, now what does he do? You know what I mean? And so yeah. then you, then you start thinking like, did I leave this kid in a better position? Cause now he's in, in mega pain. And this is the problem with, dentistry as uh as a mission trip like it's not a sustainable um it's not a sustainable mode of delivery for providing care and um i'm the first one to say that and yet i still go on these um dental brigades general mission trips but it's it's really hard um when you start thinking well what can we do and and then you start thinking well okay maybe i can train someone to be a dentist and you're like, well, I can't really train anyone to, you know, cram four years of dental school into a week. Like how am I supposed to do that? Right. Like there's, it's difficult. So you try to do what you can. And my mindset has always kind of shifted to, well, where would this person be a year from now? And I kind of treat based on that. So like, if I don't think I can save the tooth, then yeah, I end up pulling it. But like with front teeth, it's so hard, man. I've been in the same scenario. I was in Guatemala in 2010 and, you know, long story short, I ended up pulling a front tooth on a girl and she's like, oh yeah, we're all done. It was great. Like same thing, like give her a high five. It was great. Then she looks up and she's just like, Hey, uh, when does my next, this is in Spanish. I needed a translator. She's like, Hey, we're all done. And she's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, but, but, but you're good. You did awesome. And then I'm like, you're good to go. And she's just like, but wait like when does my next tooth grow in and my heart just dropped and i'm like uh that was your permanent tooth like you're not getting another tooth and then she looks up with me with like a tear welling in her eye and she's just like how am i gonna get married and then it just hit me and it was like i still get goosebumps right now thinking about that and you're like the actions we do are so permanent we we try to put it in perspective of of like you know cavities and biology and what's going to like, what, what should be done. But then we forget about the whole socio aspect, like the sociological aspect of what is this person going to do for the rest of their life? Like now they have no front tooth and they may not have access to a denturist. And and it's, it, it really messes with your mind, man. Cause like, I think about that all the time. You're like, are we really doing good when we go on these trips? 
because I'm sure that little girl was not too happy with me that day. But do you agree with the people that are kind of like, you shouldn't be doing these trips because you do more harm than good because it's always balance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think we are doing harm because we have to, I think if you go in with the mindset is like, you know, you're saving the day, like you're the mighty Canadian coming in and, and my girlfriend, Nicole, she works in development. She's amazing. We talk about this all the time. Like if you go in with the, with the intent of being like, Hey, I'm, I'm the Canadian coming in. I'm so much smarter than everyone here. I'm here to fix all you guys. And then I'm going to leave. Like if you go in with that intent, yeah, I think you are doing harm. If you go in with the intent of like, you're here to provide emergent care and get people out of pain and understand that there are things you can't do. Like those front teeth that need root canals. Like I can't reliably do that on a school desk with minimal equipment in rural Guatemala in the mountains. You know what I mean? So, um, like there's things we can and cannot do. And it all depends on what the intent of your trip is. I think if you're there to provide emergent care and do extractions and, and fillings, then yeah, you are helping. But um, long term, I don't, I really don't know because that same person has 31 other teeth that need to get fixed. You know what I mean? Like you took out one or you fixed one, but what about the other ones? And it's not like cavities take a break or caries take a break when you're, when, when you're not there, you know? 100%. And I have this, I have this treatment planner at my school. Do you know, you know what a treatment planner is like in dental school? You've been out for a while. It's like basically like yeah. they come and they look at your case and they kind of treatment plan the whole case for you. So it's done at one time. Then you kind of just chip away at that treatment plan. Oh, so yeah. there's this treatment planner and they're kind of the, the quarterbacks of the whole operation at the dental school. Right. And I really like this guy. And he goes, he always tells me, he's like, Akil, there's no heroic dentistry. Don't do heroic dentistry. And it's like, it's funny because the days you live for as a dentist, the days where you go in and the assistant's like wiping the sweat off your like forehead, you know, you, <laughs> you're like putting the gloves yeah. on nice and sexy, right? It's like, you're sl- you're like snapping them on your like forearm and, you know, you're going in saving the day. And it's, that is the exact wrong approach because every time I've done that, it's led to a bad outcome. The best yeah. like patients or best outcomes I've ever had are the ones that I don't even think about. And I go in. I know what I'm doing. There's no, you know, if, ands, or buts. Like, sure, sometimes you have to make a calculated risk. We have to take a calculated risk. But I, oh, it, it, whatever, whenever I think of that, I always think of that treatment plan in the back of my head being like, no heroic dentistry. There's no heroic dentistry. Don't do that because yeah. it, it, it'll feel good to you in the moment. But, you know, you, you know, you don't know, especially on these mission trips, like you said, five months down the road, what's going to happen to that tooth and what's going to, what's that person to do? Cause now they don't have yeah. that care. It's, it, it is. Yeah, it is tough. You know, I, I don't like how we've taken this conversation. We're talking about all the negatives because there are negatives. And, and if you've ever gone on a mission trip, you'll know that there are a ton of positives and there are a ton of negatives. The negatives being exactly what we said, like who's going to provide care when we're not there, who's doing follow-ups. Um, what about prescriptions? You take out four wisdom teeth on someone down there and they get a dry socket. They are hooped what are they going to do? And they're going to be in mega pain, right? So we try to train like, you know, local health um, people, whether that's shamans or um, whether whoever in that community would act as like a nurse and we give them like uh, ibuprofen and lots of gauze and instructions on what to do. Um, But you never know if people are going to have problems. Um, But let's, let's, we understand there are negatives, but let's talk about the positives because the positives, I think far outweigh the negatives. Akil, what was your most special moment or what do you, what do you feel the best about, about that trip? I mean, other than the like good you do, we got wicked training. Like I today, just yeah. today alone, I took out five uh, retained roots. Actually one was a non-retained root, but like five retained roots endo. And mm-hmm. I was able to do them with so much ease because we had done so many exos there and you know there were such complicated cases where we came here and i'm like oh wow like i don't have to raise a flap like this is this is insane so i think one from like a dental student perspective it's just experience and that's Mm -hmm. unattainable when you're in a school here because you just don't have the case you don't have the caseload 
Yeah. Shout out to University of Saskatchewan that is not letting their students go on a dental brigade mission with me. Um, just give me a shout out. Just leaving it out there. Just, 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 you know, just, just letting you know. But anyways, I'll, I'll stop my uh, complaining there. Yeah. I mean, it, as like a dental <laughs> student, <laughs> from a dental student perspective, yeah. I think it is one of the best things I did because there's no, there's no red tape there, right? It's, you see the case, yeah. you diagnose it, look at the history, go, right? Versus yeah. for good reason back home, you have, you know, as a learning opportunity, you have like all these checks and balance in place. So you don't just like go from like first appointment to extraction, but there you get to do that. So, I mean, the caseload you see is just unimaginable. Like yeah. it's, it's, you, you can't compare it it's to unreal, what you see man. in school. Yeah, totally, man. And that's exactly what we did. Like we used to take, uh, we used to take like three or four students every year um, from the U of S and they say the exact same thing. And I'm one of those people too. Like I, I learned how to take a teeth in Guatemala and with the help of mentors and, and some people say like, Hey, you're experimenting. Cause I'm sure you've heard this too. Like, Hey, you're experimenting on these patients. And you're like, no, I'm graduating in like six months. I already know how to do this. It's just, I'm, I'm helping people with the, with the knowledge that I now know. And the side effect of that is me getting better as well. Right. And so no, we're not experimenting on people while we're down there. Um, but I've heard that a lot of time too. And it, but you're right though. The amount of experience you get is unparalleled. You'll do more extractions in one week than you will your entire four years of dental school. And it, was that right? Thousand percent. Like not even, yeah. not even close. Totally. Not even the, close. The cool part for me is like, um, it's the memories that you always have that it's like, you'll still remember, like you'll always for the, for your, the rest of your entire life, you'll always remember that dude high jumping over your chair. And you'll forget thousands of patients that you see at home, but that one person will always stand out in your head. And I think that you become more connected with your profession on mission trips. You understand, well, you, when you go on one, you really understand what your profession is all about. It's not about crowns and veneers and aesthetic dentistry. It's about like getting people out of pain. It's about allowing people to eat and chew and, and function. And for me, that's, that's my favorite part, man, is like knowing I've helped get this person back to work um, who was previously in pain or getting a child out of pain that was screaming all night long because you've seen those kids, you know, with abscess teeth. Did you, did you see what I call the South American special No, down there? What's that? No. So that's the South American special. And uh, I didn't come up with the term, but when you go on some of these dental brigades, you see the same pattern of teeth. It's the four front teeth ha all have oh. early childhood caries. And then the D's and E's are completely bombed out. And the canines for some reason tend to be okay. And, uh, and then you have to make a decision because you're like, okay, so the front four teeth, the kids about four years old, front four teeth are fully rotten. There's abscesses. So there's perilous, like there's, you know, drainage sinus, sinus tracts on the anteriors. The D's and E's or the, the primary molars are all infected. So what do you do? Cause you can only give a certain amount of freezing on a four-year-old, right? Then you have to start making a decision. Well, what do you do? Right. And, and there's so many, so many times I've been in this scenario and you ask the mom and you're like, Hey, which side was he, or, uh, he or she complaining about last? And you go after those teeth cause you can only give them so much local, um, as a four-year-old and they probably haven't ate in a while and they're like 30 pounds. And so you, uh, I, I struggle with that too, man. Did you see any of those cases? I didn't see that. I didn't see the South American special, but I yeah. think, I think. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I feel like I'm going to get some hate for this, what? but I, I don't, I didn't come up with the name. I didn't come up with the name. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're just, you're just reciting what you heard. But, um, yeah. but I feel like people, when they criticize this form of dentistry, they probably think it's the hero of dentistry, which I'm exactly talking about not doing, which is, you know, we're going to go in and we're going to try a bunch of new things on, on people no, we don't know. Absolutely and not. It's like, you know, Google reviews don't exist there. So it's, you know, try whatever you want. Like that's, that's not the case. The vast majority of stuff you do is, is, you know, four, six occlusals or like DOs or MOs. Yeah. Like that's the majority of stuff you do. Right. And are you going to tell me that the patient's better off not having that done versus, you know, you at least trying to save that tooth? That would be a hard argument to make. 
So I don't know. I don't know if I yeah. really stand by that. I, I see the point of, yeah, if you're doing heroic dentistry and you know, that like one case is like a little bit questionable, it's, it's that argument, you know, sort of stands, but if you're doing like bread and butter dentistry, like I did so many cleanings when I was over there, like you're telling me that those patients are better off not having those done. That's, that's a tough sell. Yeah. Totally. And uh, it's interesting you say that when we went to India on a dental brigade, um, I thought I'd be doing so many extractions in India and I did more cleanings than anything. And uh, we called it high speed hygiene because there would be so much calculus and <laughs> as dentists, we're kind of useless when it comes to hygiene, but we know how to use a high speed. <laughs> so we would like, like take off the chunks of calculus and then the hygienist would get in, get in there and clean it all up. And you had like a little workflow station, but I, I hear you, man, it is bread and butter dentistry for not doing anything like we're not experimenting. It's just, we're, we're providing the most basic emergent care. And, and I love that, man. Um, the other cool part about a mission trip is that I feel you're forever bonded with the people that you go on that trip with. 100%. Do you agree? Yeah. Like, you'll, like it's almost like you have this bond for life now. Like you're like, yeah, yeah we were in that together and we're always going to be in that. Like, man, I still remember there's people that I haven't talked to in over a decade that I'll see at a conference and we automatically come to each other and give each other a big hug. And we're like, what's up, man? And it's like, it's like nothing ever happened. Even though you're only with each other, you may have met that person that week, but you bonded that week and you're just like brothers and sisters for life now. 150%. And you told me that before I went on too. I remember you saying, you mentioned that on a previous podcast. I'm like, I wonder if that'll happen. You kind of, you go on this mission trip, you know, our class size is big. It's over hundred people. You know, you know, some people, you don't know others, but by the end, you know, you, you kind of know everybody and you've, you've all kind of seen some shit. Right. Yeah. So it's, uh, totally. it's, it's, a, it's a totally different experience, but what about when someone goes up to, you know, there's always that argument ah, Jeff Bezos only donated a hundred million dollars, but that's, you know, that's, that's only like 0.01% of his net worth. But on the other hand, it is a hundred million. How similar is that argument to when people kind of sit at home and are like, they've never gone on a dental brigade brigade. They've never gone on a, a mission trip themselves, but they criticize it from home. How, how are those two things similar? Yeah. I don't know. I don't, when, when people criticize it, I never really say much. I've never had anyone criticize it to my face. People ask questions all the time. Um, more people ask, when can I come with you? Not, you know, what, what, like, what are you doing? But they, I honestly, Akil, they actually, it's an important point to make. So let's, let's do the math here. Okay. And, and let's say I bring 10 people with me or 20 people. Okay. We bring 20 people. We're going to Guatemala airfare 1200 bucks ground costs 1800 bucks so say we're, we're in it for three grand each so now 20 people that's thirty six thousand dollars would it have been better off nicole brought this up to me because it's very smart would we have been better off donating that thirty six thousand dollars or sending 20 people there for a week what could they have done with thirty six thousand dollars could we have trained a dentist a local dentist to go there and like be there for let's say a year for $36,000. I hazard to say yes. They totally could. But uh what do you what do you think about that? That's an interesting scenario, eh? I've never thought of it like that before. Yeah. Huh. So you're like, well, is my money more valuable than my expertise or more valuable than my presence? And the only way cuz like that's that all really mess with your head. Cause you're like, well, am I really doing any good now? But cause we're only there for a week. Right. But then you have to think, and this is how I rationalize that thought. I think, yeah, but then I come home inspired to help out more. So if I didn't go there, like just me. Okay. So I didn't provide dentistry to these areas in Guatemala and Nicaragua for a week at a time for years and years and years. Would I have started fundraising for water wells? No. Would I have wanted to like spread the word of like, man, you should come down here and help. And then more people get inspired to go down and help. And then the word spreads of the need and then more money comes to the area. 
And I almost feel like if you don't see it firsthand, you don't feel compelled to make it a part of your life to help out more. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a lot of like intangible benefit of, of going on that trip, but Nicole makes a good point. Nicole makes a good point. Yeah, totally. But that's what I would say to that person that says like, you know, donated a hundred million dollars or, or, you know, you went for a week or, or whatever. I just say there's so many benefits of still going that it's not just about the dentistry. It's about understanding the world. And that's why I say I did this trip for me. Yeah. I helped a lot of people along the way. I got a lot of people out of pain. I did the best that I could with the, with the education I was blessed with. I did the best that I could, but also it's a selfish trip because it allows me to stay grounded and it allows me to understand what's really important out there. And if I have a Porsche in my driveway, is it really matter at the end of the day? No, but I bet you it's pretty cool to have the feeling of um, fundraising for a water well that will give water to 2000 people. Hmm. So that's how I rationalize that. And it was really cool because I went to a course this last weekend here and, and <laughs> man, I have, I have a nice SUV, but I also have a 2008 civic and I drive my Honda civic everywhere. And I freaking love it. 250,000 kilometers. I drive it in the summer. My dad drives it in the winter. We love it. I don't care. And I show up to this course. I pull into this course. All these other dentists are there. There's, there's Porsches. There's like Mercedes SUVs. There's BMWs, like everyone. And then like (laughs) this six foot five dude just jumps out of this tiny little civic and everyone just kind of looks at me like, as if like, like one of these things is not like the other. And then one of them gave me a ride in their Porsche. And I was like, dude, why do you have a Porsche? And he's just like, cause it's always been my dream. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's just like, well, when I was a kid, that was my dream. And I'm like, but does it bring you joy? And he's just like, dude, this provides me with so much joy. And I'm like, so dude, like, this is the best thing for you and enjoy it. But to me, I, I just don't get joy out of seeing that. I'd way rather donate or I'd way rather, you know, give something to someone else. And so, um, for all those people that don't drive a fancy car or anything like that, like just feel of, of like other ways that you, you can give back or, or other things you can do with your money. And, and I just, I found it interesting now I'm still playing with that thought in my head. So that's why it's not developed as I'm saying it, but do you know what I mean? A hundred percent. And I think, yeah, you know, there's, there's a place for everything in life. Right. And like, you only have to justify ways to spend your money to yourself. And I think that's yeah. the fundamental thing. Like people say that all the time about like, I just found out ski clubs were a thing, right? You know, you go to a ski club. <laughs> yeah, you and told you get, me that, man. <laughs> yeah, I told you that in Japan. I'm like, there's these things called ski clubs and you are a member at this place and you go down the same hill over and over again. And for me, I like would a never golf do club? that. Yeah, it's no. like a golf club, but it's a club where you like, you. it's a ski club, right? And I'm yeah. like, in my mind, I'm like, I thought the point of skiing was that you got to ski new hills. And, you know, same thing with golf. Like, I don't know if I'm, I'm a golf club kind of guy, but then again, there's people that derive a huge amount of value because they get a, a, a community, they get a, you know, an, an, a network of friends, they get, um, you know, people, they get to do the thing they love to do, and they can do it together with someone, right? So like, I think it's it's easy to say, you know, like, oh, that guy's an idiot for doing this, or, you know, someone might say that about, you know, spending money on bringing dental students over and being like, hey, you could just donate that amount and yeah. save way more people and, and and help way more people. But I mean, like we started the episode talking about, you do it because it makes you happy. Right. Yeah. And like being clear about, okay, I'm doing it because I'm driving a Porsche. Because, I don't have a Porsche. I'm driving a Porsche because it makes me happy versus I'm going to take 30 or 20 dental students to Guatemala because it makes me happy. Or I'm going to belong to this sweet ass, ski club it doesn't even it doesn't even roll off the tongue <laughs> properly ski club because it makes me happy it doesn't matter however you want to spend your money that is up to you you earned it and yeah. you could spend it in whatever way you want but in the meantime i was looking at you know the, the stat you were mentioning about like how much money could it could help and i was do you know who ali abdal is um it sounds very familiar is he a physician in uk yeah, 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 exactly. He's a YouTuber. Yeah, okay. He's a yeah. YouTube physician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Ali 
worked for the NHS. So he was part of their, you know, public uh, healthcare network, but he stepped away from uh, medicine to pursue YouTube, right. And on various online businesses. Yeah. And the constant thing he was told was you're, you're sac you're basically killing people by doing this because you're sacrificing your time as a doctor, as a physician in order to go make YouTube videos, right. Which have like tangibly a low ROI intangibly in his argument, a much higher ROI. Right. And I remember he, he, he cited the stat that was about how many lives a physician actually saves in their career. Right. So I did this quick, I don't, I don't remember the number, what, what the number was. So I had to Google it. There's this article by the medium and it says that the expected impact of becoming a doctor, um, is basically you save 25 lives. And this was around, I thought the number was seven, but it's 25 according to this article. But it was interesting because then I looked up, okay, how much does it cost to save a life, right? So if you want to like equate 25 lives to like a cost per life, how much does it cost? And according to givewell.org, it costs about $4,500 to save a life. And it's typically malaria drugs, which a lot of people die from. Yeah. And you can, you know, supply malaria drugs, malaria, you know, uh, AIDS. And it costs about, they 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 calculated it based on this $7.2 million grant. They said it costs about $4,500 to save a life. So, huh. I mean, if you look at anything, right? So like one Porsche can, you know, you could save like three dozen lives, right? Effectively. So it's like, yeah. it depends how you skew the data and the data sometimes, you know, will lead you to feel bad about yourself or feel bad about your decisions. But I thought that was a pretty eye-opening stat. And I remember him saying it, so I won't, I won't take credit for it. It was him that actually came up with that, you know, that's pretty incredible. Calculation. First of all, I love the way your brain thinks that like you'd even pull that up. <laughs> but it's true. That's right? incredible. Well, way to way to put physicians' lives in perspective. How many, dude? Look it up. How many lives do dentists save? Is it like twenty six <laughs> or twenty seven? Dude, are you kidding me? Have you not heard of the the Carey's death syndrome? How <laughs> many lives does a dentist save? Man, that's that's wild. I, I never. I would have guessed like in the thousands. I would have never guessed twenty five. Yeah, twenty five. And it's it's huh. again, but there's there's so many ways of skewing that sort of data right oh totally right so i mean nicole you have a really good point <laughs> a very good point <laughs> but there's also the, the the counter argument which is you know as you said the intangible of going there and changing yeah 20 people's lives forever so what is that yeah. worth mm. and also if Boom. you save a Dude, life that's the mic drop right there if you save a life is that better or worse than saving quality of life oh who are you man <laughs> i'm telling you the couple smart. of glasses of wine i'm uh oh, man, <laughs> just flowing. J, J Lore is uh <laughs> are they paying us <laughs> they're <laughs> absolutely making some money here us. <laughs> if J Lore wants to sponsor the pod by all means <laughs> we'll even get neck of glass yeah and anything else oh, for man. today um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm going to Nicaragua. It's cool because when I started the program at U of S, um, we started in like 2015 or 2016 and we would take three students every year. And it's cool that like, I'd say 95% of those students have done multiple missions with us. Like they'll come back after they've graduated as a dentist and help mentor the students. And, and honestly, that means a lot to me. And, and it kind of breaks my heart this year that, uh, U of S there's, they have a different dean, and so they're going in a different direction, and uh, they don't want their kids to miss school anymore. Um, so that's that's tough on me. I, I really that breaks my heart a little bit, man. But uh, I really hope that everyone in dentistry um, seeks out the opportunity to go on a mission, and you don't have to go on multiple missions; just go on one, and it can it can be anywhere in the world. You can even go up to northern Canada, um, but just do it. But um, I, I want to end on one thing, Akil. When I used to go on these uh, trips, I used to come back like super depressed, thinking like, hey, I'm so fortunate. And I 
I don't deserve to like, I don't deserve to get the education that I got or live where I do or, you know, make money or, you know, who am I? I'm just, I'm just another human. And, um, it really clicked. Nicole really helped me get through that in my head. And, um, she, she just said, you know, at the end of the day, we all sleep under the same stars. There's nothing that differentiates us as humans, whether you live in Nicaragua or you live here. Um, and it, it really reminded me that we all have the ability to help anyone out there. And you don't necessarily have to go on a dental mission trip. You can help your neighbor. You can, you can help a patient in your chair, or you can help someone in Nicaragua, but we're put on this earth to help each other. And, uh, we all sleep under the same star. So it doesn't matter who you're helping around the world, just that it's going to make you happier at the end of the day. And no matter how much money you make, you will always feel better for the person that you help, not what your bank account looks like. So I just want to remind everyone in, in our profession of that. Cheers to that. That's, uh, Cheers that's incredible, that. man. Yeah. And I hope, uh, I hope you can continue to do those, those mission trips because they are truly life-changing and for anyone who hasn't done one, couldn't recommend it enough. Even if you don't do a dental mission trip, right? It's like yeah, you can do you anything. Have to, man. Yeah. You know, you, you, you have the ability to help anyone, man. So, um, just, just do it. Yeah. Just go, go explore, go have fun. And, uh, we'll see you in the next one. Yeah. We'll see you guys. <laughs>Dude, we are killing it. I mean, if, if that includes losing money on every single sweater that we make, I, I think we're doing really well. Yeah, Neki and I are donating all proceeds, which is zero, to charity because we are losing money. <laughs> so we're, I, I wonder if the charity will pay us. I think I think we got something here, man. Let's, let's keep on <laughs> let's keep, keep on losing money on every sweater. Alrighty, guys, go check us out. Hiamdoctor.com. Let's see.